the point of this is not the activities themselves. I think if we're going to try and bring this idea, we need to stop talking about the specific program per se. First, you need people to understand the vision. The vision, we, we can figure out the specifics. We can, we, you know, and, and, and that has to happen and it can be challenging. But to get buy-in, people need to understand, okay, this is worth doing. Like the people who crossed the planes didn't know all the details. They had to figure them out, but they understood the vision of what they were doing. And that's why they were willing to do it. When people want to do something, they'll figure out a way. So how do you get people to want to do this? You have to get them to see the vision. And the vision is the power of human connections. And that those connections happen at the nexus of interest and values. Welcome back to another episode of the Leading Saints podcast. And today we're welcoming in Jacob Hansen. How are you, Jacob? Doing all right. Thanks for having me, Kurt. Cool. Now, uh, people may be familiar with, with you and your content as you run the Thoughtful Faith uh, YouTube channel. Uh, where else do people see your, your perspectives online? Yeah, primarily, definitely the YouTube channel. Um, I do have a website, thoughtful-faith.com. I, I used to post more like blogs on there. I don't do that as much anymore. And then I do have a Facebook group that I moderate, which can get pretty wild because I kind of maintain it as <laughs> pretty free speech kind of place. So yeah, while it's called Thoughtful, uh, Thoughtful Saints on uh, on Facebook, um, it's it's one that. Again, if you're going to join it, just just beware. It's a, it gets yeah. a little wild. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the nature of of Facebook, right? I think I sometimes worry. Some people say, oh, you know, look at our society. We're we're so divided, and but it's like when we go to the grocery store or church, or you know, we're not like screaming at each other. I think it's just the nature of these platforms. Sometimes they they bring out the worst of people at times, and and uh, so you know, you kind of there's some uh, strong discussion sometimes on these platforms when in reality it's maybe. Uh, not as divisive as as we think it will be anyway yeah whenever i whenever i talk to people in person it's always like it, it's really funny to watch how we both are kind of like uh okay <laughs> like we'll 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 cool this off a little bit it's kind of like you ever seen that video of the two dogs that are like barking at each other from behind the fence and <laughs> yeah, then as yeah. soon as they open the fence the dogs are like stop barking and just kind of <laughs> yeah, like look at each not other. All, you're not that bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> now, and one part of your channel I, I appreciate is the the debate factor. Like you're open to really debating ideas and, and really being pushed on your perspectives or or if people put up a strong opinions, which they do on, on the internet, it's good, you know, you'll, you'll be willing to push back there. And, and that debate dynamic, uh, we're, I think we're just really losing it, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of formal debates. Um, I actually tell people that one of the things that helped save my testimony was watching YouTube debates of uh, atheists uh, against various Christian apologists. And while I have theological differences with a lot of those Christian apologists, they, they, they changed, I don't know, there was just an impression in my mind that kind of like, you know, they put out there kind of the, the religious people they're kind of the ignorant ones. And it's like these really smart, scientifically minded people, you know, the atheists that are the really intelligent ones. And I remember just watching the debates and just being blown away at how intellectually rigorous some of these Christians were and just the, the Christian tradition is and or can be. And I, I, it, it, I, I, generally say it was the thing I think that saved me from kind of going down the atheist route that my brothers went down. And so I being kind of a fan of debates and, and seeing how they can kind of really, cause, cause you only, anyone can hang out in their echo chamber and talk to the people who think like them. Right. The real question is, is how well can your ideas hold up when they go toe to toe with someone who disagrees with you in a forum that is balance. I, I often say that the fights that we have on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, that it's kind of like a street fight. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you got like 20 friends on one side who all jump in and gang up on somebody where like a debate is like a boxing match. You know, it's two people, you equal amounts of time to make your points, to cross examine one another. And I just think when you put ideas in that sort of a format where it's one on one, let's see who can present their idea better you can really start to see what ideas hold strength and which ones fall apart. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it, it, you learn so much from that when you hear them put these things up side by side, rather than, you know, like you said, these silos that are out there that you can, you can deep dive on any topic and our cognitive bias will lead us in a direction where it's like, yeah, you see, I am right. Well, yeah, that's what the, your cognitive bias is constantly looking for. And that's a safe place to be. But when you really sit in the tension of some of these discussions, you can really decide where you stand on it. And it's really helpful. Yeah. And it's very easy for people to put the best argument against the worst argument within a particular forum. I want to see the best argument from both sides. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, you have Mike Tyson go fight a 15 year old. It's like, obviously he's going to like destroy him. Right. But that if you put Mike Tyson against the other best fighter, mm -hmm. right. If you put ideas that are, we, we live in a battlefield of ideas. So like put the two best ideas argued by the most intelligent, strongest proponents of their cause, put them together and say, okay, guys, let's, let's give you equal time. And I think that's why the format matters give you equal time, equal kind of presentation ability, and then let's see who can convince the audience that their point of view is stronger. And I, I just feel like I, I'm not interested in silos. You don't find mm -hmm. the truth. There, there's the, I actually, I, I love uh, Jared Halverson. I have a yeah. little point of disagreement. I, I think what he says about <laughs> um, the proving contraries thing, I like where he goes with it. But I think if you actually look at what Joseph was talking about, when he was talking about proving contraries, he was talking to someone about um, a book they were writing, comparing different sort of religious traditions in, in a, like they were writing a history, essentially, of all these different faith groups. And Joseph was saying, look, when you get different ideas together, these different contraries, and you prove them, which in that language of that time was kind of like try them, like hmm. see how strong they are, the truth is made manifest. And so we have to get the contraries together in order to see what the truth is. That contrast is what creates clarity. And yeah. so I, I've, I don't know, in my channel, that's kind of what I hope to do is kind of provide, you know, don't hide in a silo. I'm not just going to, I'm going to talk to people who very much disagree with me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, like with, you know, this debate format, it, it's because I just think of myself, like, I appreciate watching it now stepping into that ring. That's maybe something else that, I mean, that's intense. It's like, it's one thing to be at the gym and be like, yeah, I'm probably stronger, stronger than that guy. But it's like, well, why don't you guys test step into a ring and actually find out? I was like, well, I mean, I'm good. I'm good. Like, I just want to sort of monitor, but because I mean, would you recommend most people step into a debate? Even if it's, if it's more of a casual, you know, Thanksgiving dinner type of debate. Actually, no. <laughs> okay. Two two things. Number one, it's it's very much. I think the 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 like boxing or MMA analogy is very much it. Like, I think you should work out at the gym, do all that stuff. That doesn't mean that you should like. It's your thing to get into a ring and slug it out, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think you need to have people that can do that, right? Yeah. And I think the people that that do feel like they could, that that understand rhetoric and debate and how to make arguments and that kind of thing, like they should use that talent, right, to help put out you know, good arguments for the church. And if you can do it in writing, and I will say debate, like actual formal debate, it is a skill set, And it, and I don't, just because somebody loses the, the debate doesn't mean that they were wrong. Right. It doesn't mean that. Um, and so, yeah, I wouldn't advise everyone to do it. And I don't advise people like debate is not the way you minister to people. You have to understand, <laughs> I, I make a distinction between what I call public advocacy versus private ministry. Like if I want to actually minister to someone, debate is the last thing I want to do. Right. That'll only cause problems, right? But if I'm engaging in the public square, in the public forum, where, the, where, where it's, it's, I'm not actually trying to convince the person that I'm arguing with. It's the audience that's watching. They're the jury. It's like thinking that someone was in a trial for something and that they were going to convince the defense that they were right. Like that's not, you're convincing the jury. And when you're in the public square, there's a jury watching. And if we don't ever defend our beliefs in the public square, then the other side controls the public narrative as to who we are, what we think. And ultimately that hurts the ability for the church to, to grow. And I'm not saying that we need to like obviously pick your battles and 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 we don't like people aren't brought to the gospel 
necessarily because of the arguments that are made in some debate. But yeah. Elder Maxwell, he was fond of quoting Austin Farrer, who said that essentially, though argument does not create conviction and belief, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, a lack of argument destroys the climate where belief can flourish. Like you have to create a climate where people can actually come to believe. And if you don't have anyone defending these beliefs rationally, then why would a rational person ever believe in them? Yeah. 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 That's really powerful. And and this may be a discussion. I don't want to get to our subject at hand, but maybe a discussion for a future is, and I've done some writing and thinking about it, is this concept of, you know, we have a deep tradition in our faith of being spiritual confirmation. But I don't think we often calculate in that the cognitive bias that our brain is trying to do at the same time. And so sometimes we misinterpret cognitive uh, bias um, for a spiritual prompting, like, oh, this this debate is feeling uncomfortable or like, I don't like that they're bringing that up. And so that must be the spirit telling me like, no, 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 like that your brain is resisting that because maybe that's outside the framework that you've built. But it's it's healthy to sit in that at times and 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 let that process and of course the spirit's in that but i think we sometimes default to the oh you know i feel uncomfortable that must mean that uh the spirit is left or that we we shouldn't continue this conversation but so it's it's a i think there's there's more going on in our brain spiritually and physically that we don't consider absolutely yeah absolutely so recently you uh you i guess you were on uh word radio first discussing this and then you did a, a more formalized thought through a video on your channel about um the interest-based programs interest-based programs okay and and this as you were talking through this i thought man this is such in the vein of leading saints and because as really at the end of the day what we're trying to do at leading saints you know some people misinterpret us like we're some type of franklin covey organization that wants to train all the leaders like no no like that's not our role or prerogative but what we'd like to do is put up examples of individuals who've maybe tried something different or um or approach their their congregation in a way that's really stimulated healthy culture. And the more of those ideas we can put out there, then suddenly leaders around the world listening to this think, think well, maybe I could do that. And so mm-hmm. th- this approach, this this idea, uh, I think is a, a broader idea that we've sort of tried to be, be promoting in the world of leading saints for years. But I think you put it really succinctly in, in that. And, I'm, and we'll link to the video, people can go watch it. But maybe give us a, just a a good summary of of the points you were making in that video. Yeah, so I think the it all kind of started when I um I was thinking about what works in the church. Mm-hmm. Like there are some things that work that they they really create positive experiences that when we look back in the church and we think about our experiences and you were to ask people like what are the things that really impacted you that you remember. Yeah. And um, I know that for a lot of people, including family members of mine, one of them that uh, impacted us was the scouting program, um, but more specifically, certain scout events, Yeah, right? It was the big stuff. It was the high adventure trips, especially were the ones that, that we all talk about and remember. Another one that people talk a lot about is basketball, uh, like church basketball <laughs> or church yeah. sports that people did. And besides any of the like funny things about people getting mad at each other at church <laughs> the ball fights, or whatever, right? like, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. It was just kind of like, if, anyway, there's a whole discussion you could have about how yeah. I think we're overly sensitive about that. Um, but, um, what I found is I started to notice a pattern and what it was is that it was things that people are interested in. Like when you take the gospel and you combine it with something that someone is interested in, something happens. And as I thought more about that, I realized that in the church, we are surrounded by people who share our values. Like that's, there's no doubt about that. And that's great. And we all love that. But is sharing values with someone, is that really, is that enough to create a deep and meaningful connection with people? It mm-hmm. isn't. Because I know tons right. of people who share my values, but they have, they, are, they have none of my interests. And I love them and they're my fellow brothers and sisters. And and I I love that they share my values, but where the real magic happens is when somebody shares your values and your interests, right? Yeah. And that's the reason that, and I I use this in the video, like, think about it. The, if you were to ask a boy, to be really honest, if he has a greater level of brotherhood with his football team or with his priest quorum, he's probably going to stay with his football team. Those are the guys that he's like, 
has arms around hug ah, we won yeah. the championship you know <laughs> and and but the problem is those boys might not share his interests yeah oh i'm sorry they, they share his interests but they might not share his values right and that's where and, a lot of trouble can arise, right? That's where the parents worry. <laughs> yes. And where you get the real magic. It, and we have this concept in the church. And I began to think more about it. I was like, we have a concept in the church of gathering the saints. Yeah. Like there's a reason that Joseph Smith didn't leave the church members all isolated in their little enclaves. He called them to come together as a group of saints. That is what formed us as a people. That is why, that's, that's like why we are who we are today. And, and we are very distinct for that reason, because we gathered. And we're supposed to build Zion within our own stakes, right? In the stakes of Zion. So my thought is, is it's like, why don't we, we do a great, and there are many things that we do that are great. Like I'm not, I'm not bagging on the church here. What I'm saying though, is that why don't we capitalize on these things that actually work? And, and I'm not providing any sort of a, a particular program. And I say that in the video. I'm providing a paradigm that says, look, at we often at the ward level struggle because you have a ton of people who share the same values, but very but you you only have small groups that maybe share the same interests. Mm -hmm. But if you zoom out to the stake level or to a regional level, you can get the people together who share similar interests as well. Yeah. And so yeah. why are we doing activities at the ward level where we're struggling to get, you know, the kids to be interested in, or maybe one of them's interested and then the others aren't, where if we met, went up a level, like let the kids who love basketball play basketball, let the kids who love choir and the drama program at school that are already doing that, have them gather with other saints who love that as well. And like, who are the friends that I have to this day? They're the guys that I met at BYU who loved the gospel and loved to surf. Mm -hmm. And that's where the magic happens. So it's like, if we know where the magic happens, why don't we think about ways to leverage what actually works? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I appreciate this, this dichotomy of value, looking at it as values and interests, because Oftentimes, just for a practical reason, obviously the values are there for a typical war because it's a religion and typically religions are based on morality and, and values, right? So that sort of comes naturally in this discussion. But out of practicality, we we gather people from our values and geographics. Uh, you happen to be in my war boundaries, so we gather. And and some people, you know, let's say that's actually an awesome thing about our church is that we, we have mixed uh, perspectives at times, right? And I agree. I, yeah. I, I want to let me actually make a quick caveat here because okay. I think it's very important people understand this. I am not saying that the church should modify all of its programs to simply be interest based. Like, I think that mm -hmm. that would be a major mistake. Right. But I think that what are, like, for instance, a, a temple trip, right? Like, that should be a ward thing. Yeah. Right. And I think that you should gather with people that don't share your interests right around like whatever things, because that's, a, that's, a, I, I put it this way. Ministry should happen at the ward level because that's where sort of, it doesn't matter who you are. You minister to everyone. But if I'm going to put together a basketball game, why would I try and force people to play basketball that don't want to play basketball? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, it depends on, you have to look at the activity and say, is this a ministry, you know, a service project? Of course, ward level, wonderful. Uh, a Christmas party, you know, you don't need to, like, who doesn't love a Christmas party, right? You don't need to do that at the stake level, do it at the ward level, right? Or, or, or the trunk or tree, like, great. Like, there are all sorts of things that we can do there. But, but I just think that if we were to, this idea of forcing people and obligating people to go to activities, is sort of a weird concept. It's like, why don't we provide activities and then let the people that are interested come? And by the way, if you can't find anyone who's interested in your activity, then don't do that activity. That's a stupid <laughs> activity. Like actually, like right. that's, that's a reflection on you, not on them. If you can't do something that they're actually interested in. And, and so in my mind, their ministry is something we call people to do. Yeah. You know, a basketball game, why force the kid who, who, who genuinely, like, uh, there's, there's a kid in my ward, he, he, 
I know for a fact the reason that he doesn't go to basketball is because it isn't because he like isn't a participator or whatever. It's because he's genuinely embarrassed. Mm-hmm. Like he goes out there and he feels like he looks like a fool. And to be honest, he kind of does because he <laughs> it's not his thing. Yeah. So yeah. so why not find something that he would love? And we 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 often do this at the ward level. We're like, oh, well, let's let's see if we can find an activity that he likes. Oh, great. So then you put on that activity and he's the only one who shows up because no one else cares about that thing. And it's like, we can fix this problem. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I kind of went on a little tangent. There. No, yeah, that's helpful. <laughs> and a few a few forces here that uh, I like sneak their way in here and sort of mess this up is this, the I think of the dynamic of tradition, right? It's like, well, you know, Jacob, we've always done that chili cook-off in the fall. And, you know, that's where our, the, a good chunk of our budget's going. And so, I mean, we can't get, like, this is just an opportunity to maybe step back and say, the tradition was great, but like, we're, we're not maybe considering the interests in there. We, we're gathering people of certain values geographically, but nobody sat down and said, "Is I mean, everybody, I guess, Scott has got to eat, right? So let's do a chili cook-off. But I think there's a deeper dynamic and a gathering, a, a Zion-building effort we can do when we step back and, and take those extra steps of of figuring out the interests that are in the room. Yeah, and and people are different. We always talk about the fact that we're all different. You know, we all have this stuff. It's like, exactly. So what we should, the problem is though, is you, is that different, you have different groups of people, right? You have the kid who's really into one thing or the adults that are really into one thing, but not another, right? But when we start to gather those groups together, now they should gather kind of as saints, just because they're saints to do ministry, service, ordinances, all of that kind of stuff. That's where we gather as saints in priesthood, uh, oriented sort of functions. But Zion is not just a society who gets together once a week to take the sacrament or go to the temple. We're a group of people who interact on all sorts of things. And we need to stop thinking that we can't gather into sort of sub-interest groups because we already do. And, and that creates community around those things. You know what I'm saying? It just, yeah. it, it's, you can create human connection, and that's that's sort of the the real thing that that I'm driving at here with all of it. It isn't about entertaining people, okay? This is one thing I want people to understand. This is not just about going out and entertaining people. Like you can go and entertain yourself in the world. It's not. <laughs> right. It's about yeah. creating connections between the saints, and especially for men, although this also happens with women, but I, I speak more towards men because I've been more familiar with that world, is we create connections with one another, not by getting around and talking about things, but when we get together and do something that we have a shared passion for. Guys won't even say a word. You'll have two guys who are best friends. They'll go on some fishing trip. They'll talk for like <laughs> five minutes on the whole trip. They'll come home and be like, that was the best trip ever. Yep. I was with my boys and we were fishing. And like, and for a lot of women, it's just like, I don't even know. Like, what are you talking about? But it's like, <laughs> that's what we do. And, but all of us do that. If you get people who share interest and values and they get together and do something that they're passionate about. Yeah. Game magic changer. Happens. It's huge. It's huge. So uh, take me to, and maybe we can kind of unpack this together just as far as like, uh, like uh, I think a, a leader listening to this would be like, I, okay, I get it. That, but what does that look like? Like, what would you suggest to a elders quorum president, a bishop, a stake president, really study president, like to actually, what are the first few steps of, implementing something like this? Well, first I would say start small, start very small. Um, and it also, again, it, it, it has to be, what is the appropriate level to do the activity, right? If you're at the ward level and you just simply, and you, and I have a priest quorum and I have eight boys who come and all eight of those boys have very different interests. I'm sorry. You're just not going to be able to create very many really solid interest-based activities. It's going to be very difficult, right? So it has to go up the chain. But if you do find people that have shared interests, try and create an activity regularly or something based around that. Now, I generally geared this more towards stake level leaders. I'm not saying it can't happen at the ward level, right? It can, but it's a little more challenging. At the stake level though, you have a lot of people. And at that level, you can find a group of people to do things. So, and again, start small. Here's an example. Why not have a, a women's yoga night? 
once a month. I use that example in the video, right? I guarantee you in the stake, there's a whole bunch of women who love yoga and you get them all together. But this is the other thing I would say too. You want to, you don't want this just to be entertaining. You want to incorporate the gospel in it. And, and there needs to be some kind of a gospel element. There needs to be a spiritual thought or, you know, uh, something from come follow me or, you know, it doesn't have to be huge, but something that incorporates the gospel, have the missionaries come and, and share that spiritual thought that, that way they could potentially get to know people who, you know, and they can let people know if you're not a member of our faith, like we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to learn more. And then you have a sister who's coming or a lady who's coming over and over to this yoga night. And she's not a member, but she just loves yoga and she's friends with a couple of the ladies in there. And all of a sudden she, she hears the missionaries over and over saying, Hey, if you're ever interested in hearing from us and all of a sudden one day she's like, you know what? I really like you guys. Maybe I do want to learn about your faith. Right. Yeah, or, or I would say even the fact of that, this gets this individual walking into our buildings, like, Oh, you guys got a gym in here. Oh, wow. Like where's your chapel or do you meet in the gym or, Oh, let me show you that room. Right. Like just these more organic connections and she may come for two, three years and then let's say she has a, a husband die. And then she's in this place of like, ah, oh, like I'm, I'm yearning for God. I should reach out to Jill that I met at yoga night. And you know, for and that's sort of when these things happen. Right. Yep. And so uh, I've thought, uh, now here's the other thing. I, I talk about this in the video. I'm a lot of the leaders are going to have this thing of like, man, this sounds like a lot of work. I'm doing all this stuff. Number one, start small. Number two, think bottom up. Don't think top down. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to impose this. Like, did you have to go and tell the 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 men in your stake, hey, um, you guys should start doing basketball at six a.m. on uh, on Wednesday nights each week, or you know, every more uh, on every Wednesday morning? Yeah. No, they right, came right, to right. you, and they were like, "Can we use the gym? We need a key, right? <laughs> we just need a key. Like, let us in. We'd love to do this, right?" Yeah. Now, the problem is, is that there is no involvement religiously, as it were, when it's when it's totally informally done, right? So why not sort of combine that into, hey, if you have a program you'd like to do, come talk to us about it. Or I would even, I'm kind of a nerd and like forms and stuff. I'd be like, look, submit to us an outline. You have to say, who are the three people that will lead this? Who are the 20 people who have said that they will, they will do it? And then what is this program and how will you incorporate the gospel into it? And say, we have a certain number of these sorts of programs we're going to implement into our stake this year. And we just want to start hearing from members of our stake if you have something. But just know there's only, we, we, we have to really limit this, but we'd like to, you know, start to hear people's ideas. And, and maybe you don't get it out to everybody or ask everybody for that. But, but in some way, you, you, you start to get out like, hey, what do you guys think? And I think that you'll find people that will come to you and they will say, here's what we want to do. I will lead it. I love doing this. Like if they started a, a jujitsu uh, night, an open mat, which is a very common thing in jujitsu gyms in our stake. First of all, I'd be there in a heartbeat. Number two, I would I would help run it. I would lead it. I'm not. I I, I probably would involve non-members from my gym who are higher belt level in jujitsu than me because I'm not that high of a belt level to help like teach the the basic class that these guys come to. I'm telling you you'd get guys there yeah, and it would be fun. Yeah, right. We'd have a great time. It'd be something I'd look forward to every month. And how much trouble is that from the stake leaders? Like how much work, extra work do you have to do? Nothing. <laughs> like just get out of our way. Give it, just, just say, yeah, you can use the gym for it. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you're highlighting this because th that's where a lot of leaders will go of like, oh, like one more thing, like, or what if people bring me 10 things they want to do? Like, there's no pressure for a bishopric to even, you don't got to preside over these things or, you know, you put people in charge and, and, you know, th sure, there's going to be outlier activities that maybe a red flag comes up and you're like, okay, let's, let's talk about this. But generally speaking, these are self-sustaining. And I love this dynamic of, it brings people to the surface ready to engage in ways that, you know, they, they, maybe they're kind of, you know, they're, they're teaching the primary class here and yeah, they'll, they'll chip in and do it, but they're not really excited about that. But then suddenly they're super engaged in the context of church because they, something in their interests is, have piqued their engagement. And now they're, and then that brings in all sorts of people that you could never get to some of these other activities or, or church services that we put on. Right. Absolutely. And think yeah. about it. What happens with the trunk or treat? You get a bunch of non-members who show up. What happens when we do basketball? A bunch of non-members show up. Do we actually, do we actually want to like 
try and find people. Cause I'll tell you right now, you guys go knock on everybody's doors and do that. It's very, very difficult. I'm not saying it never works. I'm just saying that we're trying to find ways to actually reach people in the 21st century. Like we're doing missionary work the same way we did it in, you know, 1845. <laughs> And yeah. so, like society has changed. Like back then people like you, you give them an advertisement and be like, this is really cool. I'm going to read it. You know, it's like people were like bored. And so they, they, they would do that. Nowadays people are hyper stimulated, but what people are is they're also disconnected. People are looking for a chance to like, the, everybody has a passion. Everybody has it. Mm -hmm. Members, non-members. If you tap into that, if you say, come gather with us, we also love this wholesome passion that you have, this good thing that you love, whether it's athletics or outdoor adventures or cooking or, you know, ballroom dancing. I don't even know. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a million things. Yeah. And there are tons of people in our community who would love to come and participate. Yeah. And it's like, if come gather with us, be with us. And you know what happens with that? You spread the gospel. That's why non-members, when they go to BYU schools, like a huge percentage of men of getting baptized because they've mm -hmm. gathered with the saints doing things that they're interested in. Yeah. I think that community dynamic is really important because, you know, even a, a ward may think like, okay, we could do yoga, yoga night, but I'm pretty sure only two women would show. But again, the, the church is just sort of giving this backbone of like, of, of the structure. Like we just need a gym. Can we use the gym? Great. And we'll announce it in church and everything, but then you put it in the the local Facebook group. Hey, we're doing a free yoga morning here. Uh, feel free to come. And then suddenly you have 10 women there, right? And and it doesn't have to be heavy-handed or the missionaries don't have to be there. But again, we're just stimulating community, gathering people again with the saints and good things come from that. Yeah. And, I'm, and I, I've said in my video, this isn't some ploy to get people baptized. Right, it's yeah. meant to be manipulated. If you just come and you just play basketball with us, hey, we love you. We love having you with us. You're a great person. Like I'm all about making friends with people. And, but I also do believe that what we're doing is we're bringing the spirit and bringing the spirit into someone's life. That is a victory in and of itself. Cause that's all we can do. All we can do is bring the spirit into people's lives and then they choose how they respond to it. And I think that it's undeniable that you will bring the spirit into people's lives. I know like high adventure trips, for instance, the best missionary sort of experiences I've almost ever seen were on those trips when non-members would come along because they'd come along and I don't care who you are. When you're in nature and the you're by the fire looking up at the stars and you start talking about like, what's life all about? Some of these kids have never had a conversation like that in their entire lives. Yeah. And all of a sudden they go, wow, I didn't even thought about this. And they feel the spirit. Now, how do they respond to it? That's up to them. But all we can do is facilitate the opportunity for people to feel the spirit. And then they will respond to it accordingly. And our hope is, is that they will choose to, to respond to it appropriately and want to learn more. But again, it's not, we're not, like, I'm not this isn't, that isn't the goal, right? The goal is just to be with these people and to love them because when we love people, that's where the spirit is. And that's it. That's a goal in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate this, you know, again, this isn't primarily some ploy to, to up our missionary effort or, or baptisms, but again, it's a, it's a, they are, a, there are additional offerings here where you think of, you know, the average, maybe Bishop Rick thinks of maybe that the less active family or that even that family who maybe removed their names from the records. And sometimes there's this awkward, wow, we got to, we got to go knock on their door. And then all we have to offer is like, well, are you going to join us on Sunday? Yeah. For a lot of people, that's like, no way you, you couldn't drag me to that chapel. Right. But then, but if we have these variety of offerings of saying like, Hey, we're not, you, you do you, you do your life, but we're getting together. Like even last week in my ward, uh, a couple guys, including myself, got a bunch of men together and we had a wings night where we tasted different hot sauces. It was so like neutral and welcoming. We didn't even talk about the gospel. And it's like, you want to just come eat wings with us? And again, this is stimulating community, regardless if it ends up in a baptism or not. And, and our, and our communities, we bless for it. And, and that community in and of itself is a goal. Yeah. Like that, that is a goal. Now I, I think that obviously um, they're sort of good, better, best, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not going to be able to get the best, but should you try and at least get the good? Should, yeah. should, is it better that that like brother is coming to the wings night, even if he's not coming to church? It's right. like, of course. That's a huge win. 
Yeah. Is, it, is it better that we have non-members at our activities than we don't? Of course. And the more that we, and, and it comes to one of those things, like imagine, and this is kind of, I don't want to overwhelm people, start small, but think about the vision of where this could go. Imagine if on the stake website, there's just like a list of like all these awesome things. Everything from like the annual play to like the rock climbing club to like the, 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 the jujitsu group, you know, it's like, if you have a non-member friend, you now have, just find out what they're into. And the chances are we have something in the church that they're interested in. And, yeah. and again, not to say that, oh, it's like, oh yeah, we're going to secretly baptize this guy. It's like, no, we're becoming friends with more people. We're gathering people together in love and harmony because it's just like the football team example with the priest, right? When he goes and gathers with the football team who share his interests, but they don't share his values, we worry about the influence that those kids will have on him. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the exact opposite is true if we say, come and gather with us. Come and belong. Come and be part of our family. Even if you're not baptized, even if you're less active, even if you're an ex-member of the church, we can still be friends with you. And I think that that creation of community is part of how we build the kingdom of God on earth. And so this isn't about entertaining people. It's about connecting people. And at the center of the gospel, John 17 is my favorite chapter in all of scripture because I think it's where Jesus sort of lays out what this is all about ultimately. He says it's about being one with God and one with each other. Okay? It's about like why are we sealing ourselves to each other? It's the thing that matters most to everybody. The val the most valuable thing you have in your life are relationships. It's your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your children, your relationship with God, your relationship with your friends. That's the why. That's why we do all of this. And so anytime we have the ability to build healthy relationships with people inside the church, outside the church, like let's do that. And when you take people's values and their interests and you get them together and have them engage together in something they're passionate about, beautiful things come out of it. And so it's yeah. like, why aren't we like, again, I'm not providing a program per se. I'm pro providing a paradigm for how to think about what actually has worked and why it's worked so that we can figure out ways. Cause I don't have all the answers. Like it, it requires each of us to use our own creativity to figure these things out. But if, but we have to know what the end is that we're trying to get to and the, and how to get there. And that's what I'm trying to just frame the way that we think about it so that that way we can replicate what has already worked in the church and made us so unique as a people. Anyway, yeah. long, long, it's powerful. <laughs> no, it's great. I appreciate you going into that. All right. I want to take off. Like I want to address any, any excuse or concern that maybe leaders have out there. And so I'm just going to throw these at you and you can bat them down. Like Jacob, what about the budget? We don't got the budget for these things. What would you say? Um, there is, there is a legitimate question about that, but I would say that, um, a lot of these things don't require a lot of budget. Right. Exactly. Like a yoga uh, night or morning or jujitsu. Yeah. You know, like, like just open the gym. start, start yeah. with the ones that don't require a budget. Like, <laughs> yeah. like you can do that. And, and for the ones that do, um, and this may get a little crazier, a little more radical. Um, I, and I know that there's something about like fundraising outside the church or whatever, there's a way I think, and again, this is just me brainstorming, is what if the organization, like the group, you say, okay, your group isn't officially affiliated with the church in any way. That gives you the ability to fundraise, right? Because you're not a church organization, but the church is going to allow you to use the gym or whatever, right? It's as if there is an outside organization that the church is merely allowing to utilize the gym or to utilize some facility, right? Um so it's kind of like the, the Boy Scout model is sort of what that is. That was an outside entity, could do all of its own fundraising, kind of independent, but the church would in some way facilitate it. Is that possible? 
I, I don't know, but I'm I'm getting a little bit more out there with like, all right, if we're going to be creative to try and figure things out, I think that we we potentially can. Yeah. I think most people will find the vast majority of the ideas that come to the surface cost little to nothing to facilitate. Um, and I would, you know, a part of this, you know, I just think of this is maybe an opportunity for leaders to see what, where the budget's going, step back and say, what could we take away? Cause I know you would be shocked. I, you know, I've been in Bishop, different bishoprics and things. And I know you have too, Jacob, where I think a lot of members would be shocked how much like the Christmas party costs the ward and for just like doilies and cold ham, you know, it's like, what if we readdress that? And sure, I'm sure we've got to get together something around the holidays. That's fine. But I would trade the entire Christmas party for 10 of these things happening year round. Like it would be, it would be transformational from a cultural and a community dynamic that you can have the Christmas party budget if, if we can really make some, some headway on this. Yeah. Yeah, I I think you can get creative with the budgets obviously. Um, But, but I, I will say that if something costs a lot of money, it does create a, an additional challenge and you may yeah. have to get creative in, in how it's done. And I've had a lot of people say, well, why don't we do these things just outside the church entirely? Uh-huh. Right. I've heard a lot of people bring that up because the point is, is that if it's done in the context of the church with the saints gathering together, we actually are creating community around the church and the gospel. And that matters, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah, you can go, anyone can go out and start a, whatever soccer club, but the idea is we're gathering saints together. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah that, so that, that leads into maybe the next concern people have like Jacob, I tried this. My Bishop said, no, I can do it. Um, th- th- I could just couldn't get the, the leadership behind me. And so what would you say to that person? Well, one thing you might consider is maybe your idea was a bad idea. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or, like, okay. or, or really well, expensive. One thing I, or, I do yeah. think, and I, I've had to think of this because it is, I think, a challenge is that some people will bring up ideas that are just stupid and won't work. Um, <laughs> right. And then they're going to be all, all you know, upset that their their idea didn't get didn't get chosen. So, mm-hmm. so that's one thing. Okay. Sure. Is is maybe the the bishop had a legitimate reason why you're, why they shouldn't have done your idea, but the other is. Um, yeah, I mean, you will have a challenge with leaders that will want to bat this down. Now, I also think we need to be aware that we don't need to be commanded in all things. If you have a particular stewardship, remember, you are already called on. Like some people have been like, well, this is like a big change. It's not a change at all. Mm-hmm. Like, is there some big change that the guys go and play basketball at 6 a.m. at the church? No, we're already doing this kind of stuff. It's it, it's it's not, it can all fit as so far as I can tell within the existing rubrics of doing activities in the church. The only thing that's really changing here, like the stake is supposed to put on activities. Wards are supposed to put on activities regions. I think even to some extent are to put on some kinds of activities or programs. And this isn't, this is within the framework of doing that. I'm just saying, why don't we do it in a way that's more effective? Yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. I'm not I'm not here advocating for some new program that's going to require first presidency approval. I'm saying, why don't we within the current guidance that we have in the handbook just do it more effectively? There's right. a handbook that says you can't have a, you know, a <laughs> a cooking group that meets at somebody's house once a month to learn to cook a new dish. That's right. As long as you don't do it at the church and cook. You can only warm up at the church. I know. That's a, <laughs> lawyers ruin everything. <laughs> Uh, any other like concerns or uh, challenges that I, I haven't brought up that, that come to mind for you? Yeah. Um, liability stuff. People bring oh, yeah. that up mm-hmm. for different activities. Um, and depend, I mean, I don't want to say like, oh, forget that. I mean, obviously like, yeah, you gotta, you can't do things that are extraordinarily dangerous. Um, <laughs> but think about the things we're already doing. Okay. Like basketball has a liability to it. People can get hurt playing basketball. Um, people can get hurt on a high adventure trip. You know what I mean? Like these things do exist. In fact, people have gotten hurt. Um, like, so how do you deal with liability? Well, how does anyone deal with liability? How do we have clubs anywhere? You have people sign a form that says they waive liability. Like, are we really going to act like with the army of lawyers who are like in every state presidency in the church (laughs) that we can't figure out how to put together a simple waiver that protects the church from things, or you do something that is officially outside the church, you distance it from the church, right? So it's its own thing. And then 
the church just in some way al- like allows this outside entity or group to utilize some sort of facility or or we at least announce it and make, yeah. let people yeah, know that, hey, in yeah. our community, there's this thing that a bunch of the members of our stake do. We'd love to encourage you guys to attend with them. You know what I mean? So there's a way you can sort of create levels of of separation potentially. But again, that's a question you talk to an attorney about and get creative. You know what I mean? Like we were the people who crossed the plains and built cities in the desert. Okay. We can (laughs) figure out how to put on an annual tennis tournament. Mm -hmm, Okay. mm -hmm. Like we, our ancestors would be ashamed of us (laughs) when they see how, how just ridiculously not uh creative and uh um, and on top of things that we could be especially in, in our age with all of our technology and comfort yeah it's true i agree i agree um and uh what else are we missing i think we've pretty much hit on it i i would just say that uh, kind of in closing um that the the point of this is not the activities themselves, okay? I think if we're going to try and bring this idea, we need to stop talking about the specific program per se. First, you need people to understand the vision, okay? The vision, we, we can figure out the specifics. We can, we, you know, and, and, and that has to happen and it can be challenging. But to get buy-in, People need to understand, okay, this is worth doing. Like the people who crossed the plains didn't know all the details. Okay. They had to figure them out, but they understood the vision of what they were doing. And that's why they were willing to do it. When people want to do something, they'll figure out a way. So how do you get people to want to do this? You have to get them to see the vision. And the vision is the power of human connections. And that those connections happen at the nexus of interest and values. Okay. I remember I had a uh, a lady on my mission that um, we were teaching this one lady and her friend was there. And her friend never, she was kind of rude to us. And she was never really that wanting to participate. And I, when I had arrived at this area... I asked my companion, why don't we ever try to get this, this lady, her name was Allie, get Allie involved. And they're like, dude, she's like, she's kind of like, she's not interested, dude. Like you don't want to do it. But I kind of, I noticed that she would sit there and she would kind of listen, but she wouldn't really participate. And she had her little boy who was like three years old. And I said something to her during one of the lessons. I kind of turned to try and include her in the lesson. And, and I asked her something about, I can't remember what it was about like, well, what do you love or something like that? And she goes, I don't love anything. I hate everything. She was very like sour and just someone who was dealing with depression, all these sorts of things, but she was just bitter and like angry almost. And she said, yeah, I hate everything. And I looked at her and then I looked down at her little boy and I said, do you hate him? And she stopped and she looked at me and she got almost like tears in her eyes. And she said, he's the only good thing I have in my life. And I was like, I know how to talk to this lady. Yeah. And I began to talk to her about the gospel as it related to her son, because she was passionate about her son. That was the thing at the center of her universe. And I remember we went to the temple and uh, we did a a lesson on the temple grounds at the Buenos Aires temple. We talked about families and uh, she came with us and uh, she agreed to be baptized after that lesson. Wow. Cool. Um, And it was. But what I realized was, is that there was something in her that she was passionate about. And in this case, it was her child. And it was very easy to connect her child to the gospel, obviously. But everybody has things that they're passionate about. And when we connect with their passions, when like that kid who who never talks, who always sits in the back, there is something that if you bring up, that kid will talk your ear off. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Okay. And if we can find those things, this is the vision. If you can find those things, everybody has them. You can actually get people to come alive and they will come and they will participate. They will lead. 
the people who don't want to do anything, they're always like, oh, you know, people don't participate. They Not only will they participate, they'll lead the things. They will do the legwork. They'll do it willingly and full of love. And that's sort of the vision is we if we think about interests that people have, we can create human connection and we can we can really touch people. And I really do believe that. Yeah, it's powerful. I, I'd encourage, you know, I, as my audience knows, I have a lot of thoughts on Elder's Quorum and how it can sometimes go stale. And this is like a simple way that you could start is uh, next Elder's Quorum, just, just having the men stand up. Sometimes they're in the culture hall, so there's lots of space to work with, but have them stand in categories of who are the outdoors guys, the hunters? I want you in this corner. Who are the gamers, both, you know, uh, electronic gamers and tabletop gamers who are the sports guys right and maybe you create subcategories there and and then say now just talk to each other for five minutes and plan something and uh let us and report back and i guarantee you there will be guys of that will begin to do things like that and it will bless their lives and it will transform the nature the culture of of that quorum by doing so so i i can't i can't stress this enough i'd love for people who are listening to this or maybe um uh, with this, uh, maybe an interest is sparked there. Maybe you're going to try some things. Report back. Let's gather these stories, share ideas, see what works, what doesn't. Because this, uh, this is really what you know. There's so much complaining about. Oh, that's not doctrine. That's culture. That the culture, the church is negative or too judge judgmental. You do these things. This is what transforms culture and gets us started uh, down the right the right path. And and where people are like, I, I want to gather with these people. Judgmental. What are you talking about? You know. And uh, so it can be so powerful that way. Uh, Jacob, any um, if if pointing people to uh, your platform and whatnot, where where would you send them? And we'll definitely link to it as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, probably the best place is just on YouTube. Just look up uh, Thoughtful Faith. Um, and I have a variety of videos with debates and conversations and all sorts of stuff, including my most recent video that I did, which uh, talks about these interest-based programs. And uh, yeah, would love to love to have people check it out. Awesome. Well, last question I have for you, Jacob, is you uh, have, uh, had opportunity to lead both formally and informally in, in, in the church. How is being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Oh, shoot. Um, I think I've gained more empathy for those who have to lead. <laughs> being, a, being a leader um, requires you first to be a good follower. And um, if the, the greatest leaders are the ones who, uh, there's that, that image of the boss whipping the people in front of him and the leader out front setting the example. And we, I think we all know that we've seen those kind of leaders. And uh, and so as I've seen leaders like that, and as I've gotten the chance to, to, to be a leader, I just always remember those leaders um, that influenced me the most. And I just try and be like them because they are just trying to be like the Savior. And it all ends up pointing to him. He was the greatest leader of all. And all we're trying to do is emulate what he did.